Okay, okay great. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Roshanak. I'm with PG by four. I'm going to be giving an ultrasound lecture. Uh, special thanks to the ultrasound team, special Dr. Kilpatrick, Hansen, and Dr. Lee. Um, so I just want to start with a little bit of disclaimer. Uh, a lot of uh, things that we're going to be talking about, there's not a lot of strong data or studies uh, behind them, so I'm not going to go that much into like test characteristics. Where there are studies, I'm going to kind of discuss them, uh, but some of them really don't have uh, good studies. Uh, but I just want to discuss them so that you have them as kind of like a, uh, another data point that you can add to your history of physical exam. Uh, I will be, the, the theme of the week is ophthalmology and ENT. So I'm going to talk about two uh, pathologies of the neck, uh, like head and neck. One is diagnosis and drainage of peritonsillar abscesses, which are semi-common in the emergency room. And also I want to touch on uh, cervical lymph nodes, like normal versus abnormal. Um, so first, peritonsillar abscess, uh, kind of diagnosis and drainage. Uh, a little bit tough, kind of like anatomy. This is like a very simple uh, image. You see the uvula, you see the heart palate, you see your palatine tonsils, and then behind the uh, palatine tonsils, you have this space uh, that is the peritonsillar space, and there you can form an abscess. Um, how it looks like, uh, and, uh, physical exam, oh, sorry. Okay, um, is that you're gonna like in that space, you're gonna form an, uh, have an abscess and then it's gonna look uh, red and inflamed and the pressure from the abscess is gonna uh, push your uvula to the other side. Um, and then they divide it basically mostly for aspiration purposes the superior pole, middle pole, and the inferior pole. And usually the superior pole is the area that you would go first when you are um, aspirating uh, kind of um, based on the anatomy and like blind. Um, when the uvula is very deviated, it's kind of easy to diagnose. You know there's gonna be a big collection there that's deviating the uvula all the way to the other side, uh, but that's not always present. So the kind of like the challenge is to differentiate, is this a very tiny abscess that you're not really gonna get anything out of? Is this a cellulitis uh, or is this an abscess that you're gonna be able to um, get like aspirated successfully? Um, okay, okay, a little bit more anatomy. Again, you see the pretonsillar space over here behind your tonsils and then here you have a pretonsillar abscess. And then just note how close the carotid artery is to the kind of posterior wall of the abscess. And that's gonna be important because when you're aspirating, obviously you don't want to poke the carotid artery. That would be less than ideal. Um, and kind of ultrasound can uh, help you a little bit, a bit visualize this better. Uh, but in general, the carotid artery is very close to the posterior wall of the abscess and you kind of wanna be careful about that. And we'll talk about the procedure itself too. So the probe that you're gonna, um, they have, there are two techniques. I'm gonna show both of them. Uh, but the probe that is going to help you the most is the intracavitary probe um, that you are going to basically mm, put a probe cover on it, obviously, and then go into the mouth and put it directly where the swelling is, uh, and obviously scan it into um, kind of orientation. So either you're going to do it with ultrasound guided or just use the ultrasound to confirm that there's an abscess, or even if you're doing it like landmark, uh, based or certain things that you need. So it's going to be a, like the, basically the mouth, the cavity is going to be really a small space to work with. So you want to uh, maximize uh, the amount of space that you have. For that, you can give the patient a number three or number four Macintosh laryngoscope plate, sorry, to uh, hold their mouth down. And then they can, you can also, either your assistant or the patient themselves can hold the suction kind of similar to uh, what they do in dental offices uh, to kind of uh, suction out any secretions. Um, it makes it more comfortable for them. It makes it more e easier for you. And then you wanna give them anesthetics. You can uh, use topical benzocaine spray. Um, you just spray um, on, the, on the area of the swelling that you want to um, aspirate. Or you, if you don't have that, you can nebulize lidocaine without epidephrine uh, for five minutes. And then you need the 18 gauge needle for the aspiration itself, and then you need your probe cover to cover your probe. Obviously, you don't want to stick 
uh, not like a probe without a cover into somebody's mouth. That would be kind of disgusting. Um, so what you're going to see is that, so the closest thing to your probe is going to be your tonsil because you're putting your probe again directly on the tonsil. And uh, this is a normal tonsil. As you see, uh, kind of this is, this, there's, there's no abscess here. This is um, the structure that you see is has this hyperechoic band in the middle and has a little bit of a lobulated margin and they have a hypoechoic um, parenchyma. So that is how a normal tonsil looks like. And then compare that to the tonsillitis on the left versus uh, pretonsillar abscess on the right. So tonsillitis, you're gonna have a preserved kind of look of the tonsil. You're gonna have the same characteristics that you saw in a normal tonsil, but it's just gonna be larger. Um, and then if you put color Doppler on it, you're gonna see increased vascularity within this big inflamed angry looking tonsil as opposed to pretonsillar abscess on the right side uh, that you can see actual pus inside uh, the abscess. And if you move your probe around, you can actually see the pus moving a little bit. And then if you put um, Doppler on it, you're not gonna see vascularity within uh, the abscess. If your hand shakes or if you move your probe, you're gonna have some motion artifact, the one that you're seeing on the bottom, like the blue motion artifact on the abscess itself, but you're not gonna have vascularity. Uh, this is another kind of visualization of the same thing. You're going to see the pus, you're going to see the tonsil. Um, and then, so you can either stop here, you just confirm that the abscess is there, there is something to aspirate, and you can just withdraw your um, probe and then aspirate it landmark based and blind, uh, or you can do it under the guide of ultrasound. Um, and some of the studies, we're, I'm going to get to them, some of the studies were actually done um, by just visualizing the abscess and the procedure itself was not done under, under the guide of ultrasound. Either way, uh, remember how close uh, that carotid artery was. I think in the previous slide, uh, you could see it under uh, ultrasound as well. You see here, you have your uh, artery right here, kind of like very close to the posterior wall of that abscess. So because of that, and because you don't, uh, want to hit it, uh, you can use techniques, and this is either way if you want to do it under the guide or um, blindly, I would suggest you do this to limit the amount of your needle that can physically go in. So you might say, I have very steady hands, I'm just going to go very slowly and I'm going to aspirate all the way, and that's great, but just remember that you're, you're going to be holding on to the end of this syringe and everything is going to be in the air, you're in, in the mouth, the patient might move, they might sneeze, you might get shaky. It's not like a skin abscess that you can, or like other procedures that you can completely make your wrist and hands stable on the patient. You're kind of holding this needle in there. So there are two techniques to kind of like limit the amount of your needle uh, that can go inside the abscess. You can cut the cover of an 18 gauge uh, needle, the plastic cover, um, and kind of uh, go that way and like cut it for like one centimeter. You can also use your ultrasound when you were um, scanning and seeing how uh, close that carotid artery is. You can actually measure that too, but you don't necessarily need to. If you cut it for like one centimeter, you should be okay. Just remember that when you cut the plastic, the edges are going to be sharp and there might be like little pieces that might get um, kind of um, dislodged and go into the airway or damage the mucosa. So just make sure the edges are not very sharp. And the other, I have used this technique a couple of times that I have trained PTAs, uh, but the, recently I saw the right kind of the, the technique on the right side, which I actually like better and I'm gonna try. So you can take a pediatric uh, tube, like a blood sample tube that we have, that red one is very similar to what we have at County. You can remove the cap, you can cut the piece that is under the cap and then put it backwards into a syringe. So you are gonna be poking the end of this um, pediatric kind of blood sample tube in the end. So where this person is holding it like right here. So that way you are not cutting any plastic that is going inside of the patient's mouth. So everything is gonna be uh, kind of soft and not causing injury. So I think I'm actually liking this method a little bit better. I've never tried it, but I think it is probably safer than cutting the plastic. Um, so you can, if you decide to do it under a guide of ultrasound, obviously you can see your needle going in and you can um, see the, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Uh, you can see the needle going in and also you can actually see the, um, the abscess being aspirated. So you can see here, this is your needle tip. As the person is aspirating, this, uh, the size of the abscess is getting smaller. So it's actually a nice visualization that you can confirm that you're in the right place and you're aspirating um, the pus out. Um, and the size is actually getting smaller. Um, the other technique that you can use for ultrasounding um, pretonsillar abscesses, which is especially useful in kids, because kids, uh, the, ca the cavity of the mouth is smaller, they're probably not going to be able to cooperate with you and open the mouth like big enough for you to put the intercavitary uh, probe in there, especially if you want to do it under the guise, just too many things going on. Um, so it might be easier to use this transcutaneous um, method. So basically, if you, like, let's say in this kid, if you think they have a right-sided PTA, uh, you use your linear probe, uh, linear high-frequency transducer, and you position it on the mandible itself, and then with the probe marker, uh, fit, um, basically towards the side that you think the PTA is. So if there's a right side, it's gonna, the probe marker is going to be towards the right ear. So um, unlike the other technique that you would put the probe directly on the tonsil, so the tonsil would be, or the PTA would be uh, the closest thing to your probe, this is exactly the opposite, right? So you're going to have your um, vasculature, your carotid artery and uh, jugular vein closer uh, to your probe. You're going to have a, a submandibular gland, and then you are going to have your tonsil. This is a normal tonsil. It's just to show like the orientations of um, how you see things. If you have a PTA, you're going to see it here. This makes it easier, especially in PEDS, to, uh, especially if you're using ultrasound, just to confirm that there's an abscess. Uh, so I am going to go kind of like briefly over the evidence uh, behind using pre uh, ultrasound to facilitate uh, the aspiration of peritonsillar abscesses. So the first study that I actually like a lot more it's a little bit of older, so it's 10 years old at this point, is uh, an RCT, the Costantino, um, that was done in 2012. It's a small RCT, the, uh, the sample size is 28. The operators are EM residents, so it's kind of relevant to us. And 14 of the operators use the landmark technique, 14 use ultrasound to help identify the abscess. Uh, but the ones that use ultrasound didn't aspirate the PTA under the guide of ultrasound. They just used it to confirm that there is an abscess. And then they withdrew the ultrasound and um, did the aspiration itself with the landmark technique. And every patient had a follow-up in two days in the emergency room to see how, is their, how are their symptoms and if they still have symptoms or not, if they have any sign of infe um, further infection. So it was nice that everybody had a, a good follow-up. Um, and then in the ultrasound versus landmark technique alone, uh, they saw an increase in, uh, like the correct diagnosis, the successful aspiration was higher in the uh, group that used ultrasound. And then as kind of a result, they didn't need to consult ENT as much. They didn't need to use CT scan as much. Uh, so it kind of makes sense because what they did is that those 14 that use land, uh, that use ultrasound, they actually looked under the guide of ultrasound and if they looked under ultrasound and if there was any abscess to be drained, then they went ahead and drained it. Actually, six patients didn't have anything to drain, so they just didn't drain it. So the ones that they went in to drain, they already knew there is going to be collection there. So obviously their diagnosis is going to be, the correct diagnosis rate is going to be higher. The success rate is going to be higher. And then the opposite side, the, those that didn't use ultrasound at all, I'm uh, a lot of them went in, there was nothing came out, they, they tried to aspirate, they couldn't aspirate, and then it kind of led into kind of this downside effect of, now let's get a CT and actually look at it, or let's get ENT to take a look at it. So it kind of makes sense. Um, there are obviously limitations with this study. It's a small study, it's a convenience sampling, meaning that they did, this, they did the ultrasounds whenever the residents that were involved in the study were around. So it wasn't like 24 seven. Um, they didn't have inter-rater reliability, which is kind of a little bit of weakness of a lot of ultrasound uh, literature. Um, that if I looked at, if I ultrasounded a, a PTA, uh, nobody else ultrasounded the same patient. So nobody, there was no inter-rater reliability. If I did it and David did it. Did we agree that we saw the same thing or not? 
Um, and then um, I think their follow-up was pretty acceptable given that this is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, to follow it up clinically, I think is appropriate and I think they had good follow-up. But to me, it seems like this would, it would help to see if there is something to drain or not. And maybe I will incorporate that into my practice of actually looking to see if there is any fluid to drain or not before I set everything up and try to drain it, um, try to aspirate it. The other study that surprisingly I see being cited more and I see it over like ultrasound um, blogs a lot is Gibbons from 2020, maybe because it's newer, uh, but to me it's like a less um, accurate study. Uh, it's a retrospective study. They recruited 162 patients uh, during two different periods of time. EM residents did, this, uh, did the scans, uh, 101 of them used ultrasound, 61 only used landmark techniques. And there was no structured follow-up because it was a retrospective study. They just went and looked in the charts. Um, and then they saw higher success rate in the ultrasound uh, group, um, but they also didn't see any change in the number of CT scans that were uh, involved. I have intentionally not put the rates of success and the comparison uh, because I actually don't think you can draw a lot of statistical kind of um, comparison from this study because there are just so many um, kind of limitations to this study. It was a retrospective study. They recruited, they, they looked at the charts that coded um, PTA as their discharge as their discharge diagnosis. So, so let's say if during that time that my um, I aspirated a what I thought is a PTA and I didn't get anything back and then they discharged the patient with the, with the discharge diagnosis of cellulitis and not exactly pre or abscess because I didn't think it is abscess once I didn't get anything um, out of it, then I didn't get into this study. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of like um, trials are probably failures that didn't get into this study at all. And then there's no structured follow-up. You don't really know kind of what happened to a lot of these patients. Maybe their symptoms got worse and they went to another ER and you just don't know. Um, but I think it's a good um, kind of hypothesis generating kind of uh, study. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move to the next topic. So, so my takeaway from these studies and looking at this literature is that um, I am probably gonna use ultrasound more to confirm uh, that there is a fluid, like there is an abscess, there's a collection. Uh, that can be aspirated. Uh, I've never tried to actually aspirate it under the guide of ultrasound, um, but I, I have to try. Um, so then I'm gonna kind of quickly go over uh, cervical lymph nodes. This is especially important in pediatric population. Uh, a lot of times like a mom comes and says, hey, I have been feeling this thing in my kid's neck for the past like six months, what is it? So a lot of us when the, um, examine this kid, we come back and report they have cervical lymphadenopathy. And if you have ever uh, worked with Dr. Tijani as an intern, he always asks you like, what does that like mean? Where? You can't just like say but cervical lymphadenopathy. So um, kind of to remind a little bit of the anatomy and this also helps you if you plan to do like a scan of the neck looking for the lymph node, uh, is like that these, all of these different lymph nodes and the areas that you will uh, look for. Um, this is if you are doing to do a comprehensive uh, scan of the lymph nodes, which we don't usually do in the emergency room. I don't think it is uh, really necessarily in our purview, but just to uh, know which zone you are looking at, this would be a nice um, thing to look at. Um, so you are going to be using your high frequency linear uh, array transducer. Just to remind you a little bit of the anatomy, so a normal lymph node is oval in appearance, looks like a kind of a kidney shape, and then has a hilum in the middle that has artery vein and the firm lymphatic duct. So it's kind of like vascular in the middle and not vascular um, everywhere else. Um, you can kind of see uh, the same uh, shape under ultrasound. So this is a normal lymph node. It is oval, it has this echogenic uh, hilum, uh, and then if you put Doppler, on that hilum, you can see the vascularity. And this is how it's supposed to look like. Um, 
kind of similar here. You can see that it's kind of like elliptical in shape and that hilum is in the middle. And if you put color Doppler on it, it's gonna show vascularity. Uh, reactive adenitis is when a kid comes in, they have some URI, they have some ear pain and you start examining them and you feel like this kind of maybe tender, probably tender uh, and enlarged lymph node. Uh, this is a normal reaction. The way you can differentiate it is that the lymph node still has the same structure as a normal lymph node. It's just slightly larger and has more vascularity in the middle because it's reactive. So if you put Doppler on it, you can see uh, kind of this increased vascularity in the hyla. And then this is kind of to compare with this look, which is not a great look. Um, this is when, this is the case that um, the mom brings the kid for something completely unrelated. And then they say, hey, by the way, or when you're examining it, by the way, there is this lump in the, in the neck that I have been feeling for the past six months. It doesn't seem to be bothering the kid. You touch it, it's kind of hard, it's not mobile, uh, it's not tender. And you are already thinking this might be uh, some sort of malignancy. If you put uh, an ultrasound on it, you can see that it is round. It's not oval shaped anymore. It doesn't have that like typical uh, structure of a lymph node. Uh, there is no, if you put color Doppler on it, it actually has vascularity in the periphery as opposed to in the middle, like in, as opposed to the hyalin, you see microcalcifications in there. Just as a side note, this is not to say that we are gonna be going, using like point of care ultrasound to definitely diagnose these patients in the emergency room. It's just one more data point to add to the clinical picture and add to your suspicion and make sure the patient has follow-up. A lot of times, it is really hard to differentiate between a normal lymph node and a malignant lymph node. Even when the sonographer, like a radiologist is looking at the ultrasound, a lot of these need to be uh, biopsied. So it's just, or aspirated. Um, so it's just a kind of one more data point. If you see this, and you already have this history and you already have this clinical suspicion, um, you would be kind of like prompted to make sure the patient has appropriate follow-up on everything. Um, and then the other thing is abscesses. I'm not gonna to go too much into that. I feel like we have all scanned abscesses a lot. It has irregular border. Uh, it, ha it can have posterior acoustic enhancement, uh, which means that like this whiteness shadow behind where the abscess is because of the fluid that's inside. And then you can see uh, kind of if you move your probe around, you can actually see the pus uh, moving inside. And obviously you add that to the clinical picture. And if you see fluid that can be um, drained, IND'd or aspirated, um, then you do that. Um, that is kind of it for me. This, these are my references. Uh, happy to send out those two papers as well. Any questions, comments? 